Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. You're sure welcome to come here tonight. And um, I just want to let you know that I'm the pastor of this church. My name is Alvin Schnell. I practiced dentistry for about 55 years and moved here to retire. Great place to retire, right? But uh, somehow I became the pastor of this little church. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful little ride. I've enjoyed it greatly. Um, and so there are restrooms in the back side of the church here. Any of you that need a restroom, I think it's well marked. And um, tonight you're going to have a, a very wonderful time. Our speaker, Jim Brackett, and his wife have come to spend a week with us. This is the first of eight meetings. And uh, I think it's going to be well worth your time. It's going to be probably the thrill of your life. Elder Brackett, Pastor Brackett, is um, an educator, taught physics. How many of you have taken physics? <laughs> that was a tough one for me. And he taught physics on the high school level, and I think college level too. He's been a pastor, and he's been an evangelist, and now he's um, in, in uh, health ministry, and uh, so he has a very broad background. Tonight and uh, each night, we'll meet here at 7 o'clock, and uh, we hope that all of you will come back and that you'll have the time of your life tonight. Elder Brackett, we're looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you, Dr. Schnell, Pastor Schnell, and uh, thank you for coming. My wife and I are really happy to be in Sierra Vista, our home in northeastern Washington State is a little less than 50 miles from the Canadian border. Do you know what that means? It's cold up there. <laughs> the most snow we've ever had in one year was seven feet. Uh, not all at once, but that particular winter, it was three feet deep at one point. And uh, I know it snows here once every 100 years, but uh, <laughs> it's, really not, it's really nice to be here. It's still frosting at night up there where we are. But we have a beautiful place, actually. You should come visit us sometime. Uh, I don't know how many have ever heard of Lake Roosevelt. Um, FDR is the one that uh, arranged to have a big dam built. The river is a lake now, uh, 130 miles long. Runs right near our home. And in the summer when it is hot, my dear wife, at the end of a long day of work, we have 40 acres to take care of. We're busy all the time. We actually conduct uh, six-day lifestyle programs there. Uh, we have three cottages where our guests stay, and then there's the lodge, which, which is partly our home. And uh, people come there, and we teach them how to get over diabetes, and heart disease, and almost any chronic condition. But come by sometime and visit us. And if you're into it, um, I love to water ski. And <laughs> And, and so at the end of a long day, I say this to my wife. Where are you, sweetheart, by the way? Where are you? Would you stand up for just a second, dear? She doesn't like this. But um, she deserves more than a hand. She's, she's put up with me for 55 years. <laughs> Actually, when we were in college, I heard there was, a, there was a girl that had just come to school there. I was a junior. She was a freshman that drove a motorboat, <laughs> and so I was interested in meeting her. <laughs> but uh, we, go to, we, we grab the boat, take it down to the lake, put it in. We both go water skiing and then jump back in, take it out, and take it home. And within an hour, we're back home. I really love that. Now, how did I get off on that? Let me see here. Uh, yes, this evening, uh, this is a series of lectures, if you will, on the scriptures. And uh, most of you are probably believers that there is a God and that he somehow made this book available for us through prophets, mainly people that the Bible calls prophets. Uh, actually, there's some writing in here by uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. He wrote a big portion of the book of Daniel or a significant portion. But other than that, it's pretty much people who were prophets. There's some exceptions there. In any case, um, I hope there's a bunch of you here that aren't believers. Uh, 
I'll be transparent with you. I'm going to try to talk you into being a believer <laughs> if you're not. And uh, we'll do that on the basis of, uh, I hope you'll find this experience, if you haven't already, of trusting the Bible. There's a lot of internal evidence in the Bible that it is of divine origin. We'll look at that. And uh, one of the questions that plenty of people have, and it's a, it's a very reasonable question, how do I know I can trust this book? Uh, you make claims about it, but how do I know that? And we'll, we'll look at that throughout the week, actually, uh, here and there. These evidences will show up. Um, just a quick background, because it connects with this first picture, which once I talk about it, we'll take it down so you can see the others. And before I do that, um, there was a card on your seat, three by five card and a pencil. I would be, what I want you to do with this card is have it handy there with the pencil. And when something comes up in your mind, a question of some sort, I'd like you to write it down. Um, if you're like me, you'll forget the question if you don't write it as soon as it comes to your mind. Now, as a teacher, I am just 100% comfortable with interaction with, with whoever I'm speaking to. The problem with it here is biblical questions are challenging to deal with, and it just doesn't work for us to start doing that here. I hope that makes sense to you. But every evening for the first few minutes of our time together, I will take these questions and try to provide some answers. So please get that, get that pencil poised. And when questions come up, please put them down. Um, if you could trust me with your name, you don't know me from Adam, but uh, if the Lord leads you to trust me with your name, I would appreciate it if you'd put your name on the card. And uh, even go so far... I know this is asking a lot. Don't feel like you need to do this. But if I can't answer all the questions each evening, and many of you will have similar questions, so that will be helpful. Uh, I'll call you up and uh, chat with you briefly on the phone to try to answer the question that you raised that I didn't get covered in the meeting. So my personal story is that when I graduated from high school, it was a Christian school, I took a job selling Christian books for children, door to door. And uh, that's not easy, because even if you have something really interesting, most people would rather have you not bother them at the door. Is that correct? Say yes. And, uh, but nevertheless, I was blessed. It was a spiritual walk. Uh, I felt like I would have to have God's blessing to do this work, because I felt like the devil didn't want people to have their children hear something from the Bible. And you can't have a child read the Bible. Somebody has to write stories that make sense to the child. And uh, partway through that summer, I was transferred to another town in Oregon. And there was two or three other kids doing this. And they were kind of putting together the idea that they wanted to do a series of Bible lectures, something like this, just the kids. and. Uh, I thought that was a great idea. Uh, I wasn't there soon enough to be one of the speakers, but uh, they wanted to have some music. And so I loved to sing. We had a quartet. Every night we had quartet music. And then there'd be uh, uh, the lecture by one of the young people. And uh, the next summer, I did the same thing. And I organized a series like this. And I was one of the speakers for, I think, four other guys were we would participate in that. We sang every night. And, uh, I did that for three summers. And uh, I had studied theology in college. I, I, did, I, got, I got a minor in it. My major was in physics and math, and I did a bunch of the engineering. But nevertheless, I had some background. And uh, even though I was a science teacher for 10 years, uh, at the end of those 10 years, I, I wasn't exactly planning this, but I had an invitation to, to become a pastor. And so I accepted that. My wife and I started a new life in that world. Most of you uh, might not know this, but being a pastor can be a problem. No, that's not the word. It can be brutal. <laughs> Some people don't like you. Are you aware of that? And, uh, but, you know, it was a 
wonderful time. We did that for a number of years. And uh, then I was asked to do, to do this kind of work full time. There was a television ministry, and I think that's enough of that story. But uh, part of the reason I tell that story is that uh, in those years that my wife and I were traveling, we sold our home and we lived in an RV for 16 years. We were on the road all the time uh, holding a series of Bible lectures. We did a number of these overseas. We did a couple of them in Russia, or I should say the former Soviet Union today would be the correct thing to say. And uh, I'll never forget in Western Russia, there was a town that was closed to the West because it was the most Western piece of real estate that the Soviet Union had, which is where they had all their big satellites looking to see if the US was firing missiles. You all with me on this idea? And uh, we, we got there just several weeks after the Soviet troops left Klaipeda, Lithuania. And now it was a free country. And they had, uh, some of the local people had rented this big theater. And there were like 350, 400 people that showed up, uh, slanted, you know, sloped floor, and then a big balcony, and then another balcony way up there. And I think a lot of them came because they wanted to hear English. It was a big deal about learning English. In any case, I asked them this question, opening night. I said, how many of you, how many of you have ever heard of something called the mark of the beast? I'm not talking to you. <laughs> I'm telling you a story. Every single hand went up. And then I said, actually, I, I got this backwards, but I said to them, how many of you have a Bible in your home? Two people. So it's unknown to them, the scriptures, except they have heard about something called the mark of the beast. Isn't that amazing? I don't remember when it was a number of years ago. I was shopping in a hardware store and got a few things and... Uh, went to the checkout counter, a young gal, probably in her middle teens, and when she added it all up, she said, that'll be $6.66. <laughs> and I said to her, you trying to put the mark of the beast on me? And she laughed. Why did she laugh? Because she knew about this crazy number, if you will, that is associated with the mark of the beast. Now, we're here this week to study the book of Revelation. Interestingly enough, the book of Revelation has ties all over the scriptures, and we'll try to pursue some of those to help make sense out of what the book is saying. It's an interesting story. Uh, we call it a book. You know how this is, most of you. The book of uh, Revelation in my Bible is about, that's more than it is. Uh, it's more pages. but. Uh, Nevertheless, here's something you probably know, you may not know, that the Greek word, and maybe I should just back up and remind you, that the entire New Testament was written by a number of authors. You, most of you know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were, they wrote the four Gospels and so forth, Paul the Apostle. It was all written in Greek. It's a different kind of Greek than people in Greece speak. I studied it, as I say, for two years, and... Uh, I can't understand what a Grecian is saying. If they talked really slow, uh, I might get most of it or some of it. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the Greek word that is properly translated revelation, this is the way the Greek word sounds, apocalypsis. And because the book that we now call the book of Revelation, and it, there's a reason for that, as you'll see, uh, because it, is, it speaks of the end of the world in rather dramatic detail. If you go to chapter 16, it speaks of the seven last plagues that are going to fall on the earth. If any one of those plagues fell on the entire earth, everybody would die. So these are geographical, and they're similar to the plagues that fell on Egypt when the Israelites were trying to leave you know the story, I'm sure most all of you know the story of Moses 
and his brother going to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. And Pharaoh didn't want to do that. And one by one, uh, the kingdom of Egypt was virtually destroyed. By the way, the first three plagues also fell on the Israelites. But the last seven of these ten plagues only fell on the Egyptians, virtually decimated their kingdom. And uh, the very last plague was uh, when Pharaoh was told that if he didn't let the people go, the firstborn. Pharaoh was warned about every plague, every one. He was told what was going to happen. And uh, when he was, he was told that the firstborn in every home would die if he didn't let the Israelites go. Now, the Israelites were told by God through Moses. Moses was a prophet. He, there was revealed to Moses from God the things that he should do and say. And uh, he was told that the people of Israel, and actually the Egyptians could do this also. If they would take the blood of a lamb and smear it on both sides of their door, the door to their house and across the top, the destroying angel, which is what the Bible says, an angel came and killed all these children. I know that sounds pretty awful, but that's what the Bible says. That's what happened the destroying angel would pass by the house that had the blood. That's where the Jewish people get the word Passover. And they celebrate the Passover because not a single Jewish or Israeli, Israeli, Israeli child died that dreadful night. And in fact, that's the night that Pharaoh said, get out of Dodge, if you will. Uh, and that's an interesting story. Um, but I want to have you go with me now to Revelation. Uh, I, I don't know if I finished the thought. Because the book of Revelation describes this horrendous end of the world, we English-speaking speak, people have developed the word apocalypse, which really should be simply revelation. But because of the nature of the book of Revelation, it has become the word that means a dreadful end of some kind. A dreadful, deathful end is what the apocalypse actually means. Uh, now let me say one more thing before I read to you from chapter 13. I wish you would bring a Bible every evening. I used to do these lectures, and I will do some of that this week. I put everything on the screen. I don't think that's nearly as good, folks, as you reading it in your own Bible. Would you please bring a Bible? And by the way, if God blesses you this evening with the insights that we will see, please encourage family members and neighbors to come. There's a few seats left. We actually have a room, an overflow, where we could put another 100 people. So let's do what they did in Klaipeda, right? <laughs> 350, 400 people. Um, so in the 13th chapter, of Revelation is the description of this beast, if you will. A better translation of that uh, Greek word would actually be living creature. We, you know, I was raised on a ranch. Um, Neva? Oh, well, I thought, I thought the pastor prayed, but okay. My wife was reminding me. So let's do ask God's blessing as we open his word. Father in heaven, we pray this evening that your Holy Spirit would have its way in my heart and really in every heart here tonight, and that you would bless our understanding and our effort to grasp what you would have us see. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, um, a better translation than beast. Oh, I was going to say, I was raised on a ranch. You know what we called our cows? Beasts. Uh, it's okay. It sounds kind of mean. They use the term beast, but that's what you'll find in King James and actually a lot of other translations. But it, what it means is a living creature. And here in chapter 13, uh, John is in vision. I realize most of you know what that is, but in case some of you aren't familiar, in the Bible, God makes it very plain that he can create in the circuits of somebody's brain something much better than just a dream. 
it, it's, it's, it's just like you were living it in reality. Now, some of you have dreams that are pretty real, but it's not like the visions that God gave his prophets. They could actually ask questions. They could have a dialogue with an angel or whoever was there in this vision. Now, when John, uh, John thought three times, I think, in the book, he refers to it as, I was in the spirit. In the spirit, meaning that the Holy Spirit was uh, the agent that God would use. And that makes me want to just say to you, probably all of you know this, virtually all Christian churches agree on this point, that there are three, if you will, persons that are God. Jesus, if you read the New Testament, it's clear that he knew that he was God. If you read Paul's book of Hebrews, the first chapter, he has, and he's quoting from the book of Psalms, he has God the Father calling Jesus God. Are you all with me on that idea? And it's clear that the Holy Spirit is considered to be God. So we sometimes use this term, we say, the Godhead, meaning three persons. And uh, the Holy Spirit, they each have their own function. In fact, in John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. I'm sorry for the little bit of alliteration there, but, the, but John, the, the disciple, is claiming that Jesus created everything that's ever been created. And, because, and you know it's Jesus because if you go down to verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know that uh, John was talking about Jesus when he said the word. And most of you are familiar with the fact that we think of Jesus as the word because he was a, a preacher on this earth for several years and even as a child, uh, we don't have much record of this. He lived a very precious and godly life. But in any case, in chapter 13, John is in vision. And this is what he says. I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea that had seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Pretty interesting. By the way, if you turned over, you may not want to do this at this moment, but if you turn over to Daniel chapter 7, which we are going to look at for a few minutes this evening, it describes there that these beasts, these living creatures that God gave prophets to, to look at, actually represented kingdoms, powers. And that leads me to uh, digress for just a minute about this question. How do you know who's teaching the truth? I love the Baptists. I have some really precious friends who are Baptists, but they're the best example of this I can think of. I have a, uh, several Baptist pastors that are dear friends of mine. I love these people. And... Uh, in the beginning, actually, the Baptist church was started in the UK, but it came here as a Baptist church, but it wasn't very long before some people in the Baptist church, as they were studying the Bible, didn't agree with what the pastor of the church was teaching. So what did they do? They started their own church with this correct teaching, and that kept happening till today I'm told that there's over 350 Baptist churches. I don't mean churches, I mean, if you will, denominations. And uh, very interesting how this has happened, actually, in a number of churches. Uh, other churches spring up because of disagreements. So how does a person know? Uh, how does a person know that what they're getting from the Bible is truth? Now, you're probably thinking that I'll say, because I know. <laughs> Let me give you the principles, and I'll illustrate them. Number one is, before you form a doctrine on a particular question or topic, make sure you read everything in the entire Bible on that topic. Let me give you an example. In one place only, Paul writes that a woman should not speak in church. Now, there are some people who say, the Bible said it, and I believe it, and that settled it. And I'm with that, but I'm also with the idea that you need to be careful how you derive truth. 
There is nobody else anywhere in the whole Bible, not even Paul himself, who says that. That tells you, folks, that there's something probably very specific in that church that there was a problem. Are you all with me on this? Please? Look everything in the whole Bible. And uh, that will give you a very good sense of how to proceed on developing a teaching. People don't like the word doctrine. They mean the same thing. Doctrine is teaching. But in any case, and uh, I'll give you another example of that. Um, I don't know if you're going to get mad at me for this, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. The Bible does not teach that there is an ever-burning hell. Most Christian, most Christian churches believe that. Are you with me on this? And I apologize to you if your church teaches that. I will show you later. I'm not going to do this tonight. I am using it as an illustration. That the Bible does not teach that. I can show you four texts that if you took any one of them, it could be you could, and if, and if that's all you read, you could say, that sounds to me like there's an ever-burning hell. But when you read everything that the Bible says about it, it is absolutely clear, folks, this is just not true. Actually, even though you might be mad at me because your church teaches that, I think you should be thankful. Can you imagine being in heaven with your daughter burning in hell? Or your son? Or your mother? Hell, heaven would be hell. Now, that's not an argument to say there's no hell or there's no ever-burning hell. I just want you to stop and think about it. And by the way, how long would it take somebody to die if they were thrown in a, just a cauldron of fiery heat? Ten seconds? So what would God have to do to keep people alive so he could burn on them forever? He would have to constantly be performing a miracle to keep them alive. And doesn't everybody sort of know that when you get to heaven, you're going to know everything? Isn't that pretty much the idea? Uh, which means if you had a loved one in, in the fire, folks, it would be horrible. Is that correct? And I'm just here to tell you, I say this kindly, if you, if you belong to a church that teaches this, the Bible does not teach that there's an ever-burning hell. Probably the most definitive and coherent description of hell fire is in the book of Revelation, and we will look at that later this week. Very clear how uh, brief, uh, but it is, there's no question, folks, there will be hell, and tragically enough, many, many people will will die in that fire. And it will be hard for you and me. I, I, I'm assuming that all of us will be in that better land. Are you all with me on this? It will be hard for you and me to have that happen to a loved one. I can hardly talk about it because I have some loved ones that have turned away from God. Some of you know what I'm talking about, maybe most of you. So that's just another example. By the way, you might be interested to know that the uh, scholarly community in general, in terms of scriptures, are moving away from the idea of an ever-burning hell. This is happening widely across the scholarly community. So I'm interested to see that. I have a, I have a book. I'm, I can almost think of the author. The title of the book is The Fire That Burns a very famous theologian. I, had, I first got this book 25 years ago, and the book is just full of the argument against the never-burning hell. Y'all with me on this? And he's not part of my denomination. He's just a great scholar that can see clearly what the Bible actually teaches. The second thing is we allow the Bible to interpret itself. I'm talking about three principles for knowing how to get truth from the Bible. First thing, read everything the Bible says about it. You will find, I'm back to number one, that sometimes two things seem a little different but when, but on that topic. But when you read the whole thing, folks, you'll get the picture. You'll see it. And you'll see 
then how the one that looked like it was different actually isn't a problem. It's a very interesting thing. The second thing is that you allow the Bible to interpret itself. For example, when John, and he saw a lot of creatures in the book of Revelation, and Daniel did too, I should tell you that Revelation is the only apocalyptic book in the New Testament. And the only apocalyptic book in the Old Testament is Daniel. The book of Daniel, I think you all know that name and maybe the story. Uh, I'll try to flesh that out a bit if, if some of you put a question down. By the way, how many of you written a, written a question down yet? Oh, shame on you. You're supposed to be writing questions, so get busy. All right, good for you. Uh, so I, I didn't read it to you, but you can easily look it up in chapter 7, and I'm going to actually read that pretty quick. Uh, a creature, a beast, if you will, in a prophetic vision stands for a power, a country. And so we let the Bible inform us of that. Uh, and it's very helpful in making sure that I get the right thing. Number three, and this is a little harder to just find a text, but the principle, you'll see it there, is that God will not be trifled with. If you want to know his truth, you have to, I hope you'll agree with this, surrender to him. You'll have to let Jesus Christ become the leader, if you will, of your life. And then he has permission to help you understand what you're reading. Do you know that in, in the book of Daniel, there was a vision given to him that he didn't understand? And he, he actually got sick because he couldn't understand it. And uh, finally, uh, God sent an angel to tell him what the dream meant. Very, very interesting. But uh, those are the three principles. So now back to chapter 13. He says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast, this is important, rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head, or heads, the name of blasphemy. Then he goes on and he says, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, but he had feet like a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion probably should have been mouths because there were seven of them. So a friend of mine uh, painted this picture for me some years ago. And you can see the seven heads and the ten crowns uh, on the ten horns. And he has a leopard body and what kind of feet? Feet of a bear. And this, folks, is the beast which finally has a mark. And if you get that mark, you are in real trouble. That is to say, uh, it will cost you your life, your eternal life. I'm going to stop right there, not because I'm trying to tease you to come back, but I just was, I'm trying to do this introduction into the book uh, before we get any deeper. And my dear friend Wayne is going to take this down now and put it just aside, Wayne, thank you, so you can see these other creatures. Before we do that, I want you to turn to chapter 1 in the book of Revelation. And let's get a sense of how this is all working. <clears throat> it starts out, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what's being revealed in this book, folks, is who? Jesus and all kinds of things about him. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, you and I are God's servants. I hope that all of you are interested in that. To show unto his servants, listen carefully, things which must shortly come to pass. I'll tell you in a moment why that's important. And he sent and signified it. He, God, sent and signified it, this revelation, by his angel. So God, the Father, is the source, but he has an angel uh, bring this to John. And this word signified is an interesting Greek word. It actually could be characterized by saying it like this, signified, which is indicating that this revelation 
is going to be in code, in signs. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, because it's about Jesus, and of all things that he saw. Then it says something very interesting. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. That sound pretty interesting? A little bit ominous? If I don't read it and listen to it, I might be unblessed. Is that correct? Blessed is he that readeth. Let me give you a little sidetrack here for a moment. There are three schools of thought on how to interpret the book of Revelation. Now, sometimes there's a little mixture of them, but there are three basic schools of thought. Here's, here's what they are. There is this school of thought that says all of the book of Revelation happened before the 6th century. So you don't need to worry about it. It's done. That's the, kind of the idea. Those, uh, that school of thought is called preterist or pre, pre our age was the book and its teachings. Then there's the school of thought that says the book of Revelation is dealing with the future after the secret rapture. And because you folks are all going to be secretly raptured, I'm, my tongue in cheek just a little bit because we're going to come back to that later. Uh, you don't have to worry about the book of Revelation because you're going to be gone. Are you all with me on the idea? That's called the futurist view. The other view, I'm smiling because I'm claiming I have the correct view, is the historical view. And we just read a portion of it. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this, of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. You have to be almost blind to read this book and not recognize that it is historic from the time that John received it until the end of the earth as we know it. You go to chapter 16 that I mentioned. There's the seven last plagues, which is just before the battle of Armageddon, the very end of the world. So I'm going to be uh, proposing to you that we accept the book of Revelation as a historic document given before it occurred. Is that fair enough? <clears throat> now, then it, uh, in verse 4, which is the next one to read, uh, John is now speaking. He says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. So John was directed to write this and send it to some churches that Paul had established, Paul the Apostle, in what today is Turkey. And these churches are named. It's just the name of towns. Uh, there was more, no more than one Christian church in a town, so that's the church in Ephesus, and that's the church in Thyatira or whatever. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is forever, if you will, and from Jesus Christ, so the first person is God, the second person is Jesus, and then it says, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Several times in the book of Revelation, God is pictured as being on a throne. And there are seven spirits there. In chapter 4, it just says the seven spirits are there. In chapter 5, it says they're sent forth into all the earth. What are these spirits? Well, I'd like to let the Bible interpret itself. Is that okay? If you turn to Hebrews chapter 1 and look at the very last verse, this is what it says. Speaking about angels, it says, Are they not all ministering spirits 
sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Shall I say that again? Let me just tell you what it's saying. God created all these angels, and they're interested in your salvation and mine. Amen? Do you ever say amen in your church? Uh, so the Bible teaches, and there's many other places where this is mentioned, that every one of us has a guardian angel. Sometimes when I'm about to choose to do something wrong, and I think of my guardian angel, what do you suppose happens? I think, I guess I shouldn't do that. <laughs> but that's not what the angel is there for. Uh, the angel is there as a minister. And that angel is interested in helping you understand Bible truth. Fair enough? The seven spirits, which are, that which are before his throne. And uh, it doesn't say here that they're sent forth into all the earth, but that's what it says in a later chapter. Verse 5. Uh, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead. Um, was anybody ever resurrected from the dead before Jesus was? Yes. Uh, several people in the Old Testament were resurrected from the dead. Elijah did that, and some others. So when it says Jesus is the first begotten of the dead, what it's likely referring to, and I think I could support this with other places in the Bible, it's because he was resurrected that anybody else could be resurrected, including you and me, if we should die before Jesus comes. Amen? You got, you got that? Sound like you didn't, so write me a question. What, what, write me a question. What did I not make clear there? Please don't write everything. <laughs> um, unto him, oh, I love this, in the middle of the verse, unto him that loved us and washed us in his own, washed our sins in his own blood. Folks, this is one of the greatest news there is. Uh, you, your neighbor may never forgive you, but God will always forgive you. And the characterization here is, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but in case some of you are just pretty unfamiliar with this whole world, uh, it's because Jesus shed his blood in my place. See, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So you and I are all on death row. And it doesn't mean just death for a while. It means death forever. Except for the fact that Christ came here. And this is a mystery, folks. You, you can't exactly logic this thing through. But the Bible says that, and he says, and it says right here, that he came, and because he died, he died in your place and in my place mystery because Mary had a baby. You know this. She was a virgin. The Holy Ghost, the Bible says. In fact, the angel told Mary this, that that thing that's in you is from God. And that child was, this is, you, you and I can't grasp this, that child Jesus was fully man and he was fully God. It's a mystery, folks, that we can't understand. We can say it, but you can't really wrap your mind completely around it. You can say it, and you can trust that though you can't fully understand it, it is reality. And here, as in many places in the New Testament, and it's certainly characterized in the Old Testament, uh, he has washed us from our sins in his own blood. And notice the next in verse 6. He has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. I'd love to take more time on this than I can tonight. But uh, don't misunderstand this. And again, this would take more effort to get a better grasp of this, but I'll just explain to you what I think is going on here. God wants us to be benevolent, if you will, kings. Kings have the ability to know things and to arrange things and to... <clears throat> the king in the United States is about to arrange for a couple of trillion dollars to be given away, correct? Correct. Uh, so it's not in the sense that you and I are to become some bigoted ruler. It's that we have this gift to be helpful to people, to organize things, to uh, 
direct in affairs so that people are blessed and so forth. And when it says kings and priests, this is another very interesting topic. Uh, and if I had a whiteboard, which I intended to put up here, I would uh, draw something. But it's a good thing because I'm rapidly running out of time. And, uh, but uh, say this much, that uh, the idea is that Jesus is our priest. And in the days of the Israelites, there were human priests. And you couldn't get your sins forgiven without the priest. It's not the same that the Catholic Church views it. That priest wasn't carrying your sins, but he was part of the work of taking that lamb and taking the blood into the sanctuary, which we'll talk more about later this week. So the idea is, folks, that you and I can be ministers to people. And in fact, the idea is that we no longer have to have a priest other than Jesus. Uh, in a sense, we are the priests for ourselves, if you wish, and for each other. That's really what's going on here. Hath made a kings and priests. Notice verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. <clears throat> and they also which pierced him. I think you all are familiar with this. When G 40 days after Jesus was resurrected, he was with the disciples outside the city, teaching and talking with them, and as he talked, suddenly he lifted off the ground like a helicopter. This is described in Acts chapter 1. And the disciples watched speechless. And uh, it says they watched him until he disappeared into the clouds. And suddenly there were these two white men in white, two men in white, I think they were angels. And this is what they said to the disciples. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So it's talking about that. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And Here's something very interesting. We'll look at this later this week, folks. The Bible teaches that there are two resurrections. Jesus himself mentions this in John chapter 5, verse 39. He talks about the resurrection of life and the resurrection of death. Which one would you like to be in? Number one. But there is another resurrection revealed here in the book of Revelation. Because the first resurrection, and we'll study this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and other places, Jesus comes back to this earth and resurrects the forgiven people. The Bible calls them the righteous, which is fine. The reason they're righteous is that Jesus forgave them. He forgave you and me. And when we die, if we die before he comes back, he is coming here and he will resurrect us. And the Bible calls that the first resurrection or the resurrection of life. There comes a time later in the book of Revelation when there is a resurrection of the wicked or the unforgiven. And it actually says that at that point in time, everybody that has ever lived on the face of the earth will be alive. And those who are unforgiven will be destroyed shortly thereafter by hellfire. And it will just take a few seconds. That's all in the book of Revelation. We'll see that a little later. But when it says, they which pierced him, it means those Roman soldiers and maybe even some of the Jewish leaders that organized the crucifixion. Well, the Bible doesn't make specific about that, but it's probably the case even though they're unforgiven. By the way, are there any Jewish leaders that organized Jesus' execution that became forgiven people? Yes, you know what it says in Acts 6, verse 7? It says, and a great company of the priests became obedient to the faith. I love that. I just love that, folks, because I'm a bad actor too. But God forgives, doesn't he? And I think... Um, it will be very interesting to see, of course, those, those, those people who became forgiven that were part of the crucifixion, they'll be raised anyway in, the, in that resurrection. But here are all the soldiers and whoever, God only knows, they're going to witness his coming. And the Bible actually says they will die because of the brightness of his coming. They witness it, but they die but they will be resurrected one more time. Isn't this amazing stuff? 
at the very end, like I said a few minutes ago. Notice that it says next, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. What does that mean? From every tribe, every people in the world, there will be people who are unforgiven. Is that correct? And when they see Jesus coming, how will they feel? Very, very bad. And they will, if you will, cry out. They will wail. That's what it's talking about here. I'd love to finish the whole chapter with you and give you an increased sense of what this book is about, but I'm obviously going to have to wait uh, to see how I can squeeze that in. What I do want to do is go with you to the book of Daniel. In fact, don't even turn there. I'm going to tell you the story because I can tell it quicker than you can read three or four chapters. Are you ready? Most of you know this story. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, 500 miles away, brought his armies to Jerusalem because they were not paying tribute like they should, and there were other problems, and he virtually destroyed the city and killed thousands of Jewish people and stole the gold furniture from, not all of it, because the ark had been hidden, but he stole all the gold. There was a lot of gold, folks, in that temple. He stole that, and he took the people that he didn't kill on a death march 500 miles to Babylon. We don't know. Probably most of them died. Among the people that got there, and there were a few thousand people to be sure that got there, was Daniel and three friends. I don't usually say this, but for some reason I am inclined to. Uh, they were made eunuchs, and if you can stand it, you look up online how that pretty well figured out how that was accomplished. They had a machine that with one blow would emasculate a man. Nothing sewn back on. And uh, they did that so young men wouldn't have an interest in women. And they would serve in the king's court and Nebuchadnezzar uh, looked through the ranks of the Israelites for young men who were of the royal blood and got a number of them, and among those was Daniel and his three friends. Uh, in chapter 2, and I just should remind you, the kings in those days of these, of these powers were absolute despots. They needed no reason in the world if they wanted to kill you. They just snapped their fingers and it was done. And in Daniel 2, uh, Chapter 2, remember this is an apocalyptic book. Uh, God gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream. This is amazing. He makes a wicked king a prophet. That's not the only time God did this. There's some other places. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't get sidetracked. But uh, Gideon was sent down the hill to listen to the enemies. And, and, and one of his enemies down there, of course Gideon was secret down there, had a dream, and he told the dream to his tent mate. These were Israel's enemies, and his tent mate interpreted the dream. God made that wicked man a, pro a prophet. <laughs> anyway, um, Nebuchadnezzar, and I don't. I got to be careful about sidetracking. But if you've if you've never worked in the East, even today, dreams are way bigger of a deal than it, they are for you and me in the West. I could tell you stories because I've worked there so much. But uh, Nebuchadnezzar had this amazing dream, and he woke up and couldn't remember it. And because he was so certain that dreams were important to teach you whatever, he called his wise men in. Uh, he had about five categories, the astrologers and the magicians and the wise men and the Chaldeans, who claimed to have supernatural power. So he said to them, hey, I forgot my dream. Tell me what my dream was. Ooh, they said, listen, King, you tell us the dream, and we'll tell you what it meant. And he got onto that pretty quickly. And he said, you tell me the dream or you're dead men. And they couldn't. And so the captain of the guard goes out to kill all the wise men. I'm just going to use wise men for the whole bunch. And it's very interesting, friends. I, oh, I love this. He goes to Daniel. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but it's obvious to me. This is my interpretation. 
and I love this, folks, and you and I need to be Daniels. Daniel had already been so kind and so helpful, even though he was a prisoner, that many of the people in the king's court loved this man. Are you all with me on this? So the captain of the king's guard, uh, he doesn't want to kill everybody, but he's going to because he was told to, or he dies. But he figures, <laughs> this is so cool, folks. Cool is too cheap. This is so beautiful. He figures that somehow Daniel could get him out of this fix. So imagine getting a knock on your door, and there's the king's guard said, I've come here to kill you. <laughs> and uh, Daniel says to him, why? The guard explains it, and Daniel says, would you ask the king to give me a day and tell the king that I'll tell him what his dream means? Ooh, that's faith, isn't it? So the guard says, okay. And uh, the Bible doesn't tell us how the guard went back and explained it to the king, but that's the story. Uh, and Daniel and his three friends had a prayer meeting that night. Do you think that was a fairly earnest prayer meeting? And why was that? Because their life depended on it. I don't know how many times you have prayed, folks, when your life depended on it. But you know what? Every time you pray, it does. Because you ask God to forgive you. Amen? Now, it might not have the urgency that it did for Daniel and his friends. But uh, <laughs> I love this, folks. God gives Daniel the very same dream and tells him what it means. So the next day, he goes to the king, and he tells the king his dream. Can you picture that scene? The king cannot remember a feather of it. And Daniel describes it, and the king says, oh, yes! And uh, do you think then that when Daniel tells the king what the dream means, the king will believe it? Sure. And what the king saw was this metallic man made of several minerals or metals. The head was gold, the chest was silver, thighs were brass, the legs were iron, and the feet were iron mixed with clay. And Daniel says, here's the meaning. You can read this yourself if you just read chapter 2. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. But after you, there's coming another kingdom. Inferior to yours, but your kingdom is done. Listen, if anybody else said that to Nebuchadnezzar, they were dead. Are you all with me? God has wonderful ways, doesn't he, folks? And then he says that a kingdom will be inferior, and the Bible makes it clear. In some cases, it names the kingdoms. That was going to be Medo-Persia, and after Medo-Persia was the uh, thighs of brass, and that would be uh, Greece, and the legs stood for the iron kingdom of Rome, and the feet, partly mixed iron and clay, represented the barbarian tribes that overthrew Rome and became the countries we know today. Now, in that day, they had different names, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, and so forth. But those became France and Germany and, and all, the, all the countries that in France that we know. So the Bible has given this prophetic picture so clearly, folks, that Bible scholars who are doubters said the book of Daniel could never have been written in 600 B.C. It had to be written sometime after all of that happened, or he couldn't possibly have written that stuff down. Am I making sense what the claim is? That the, the historians see so clearly that it, what it described correctly that they say couldn't have been. We have absolute archaeological evidence, folks. And here's a, here's a place where you could, if you struggle with believing that the Bible is God's word, you can put yourself here. The archaeological evidence, I have two good friends who are archaeologists. I have talked with one of them some and with the other one a lot. It is irrefutable, folks. We know when this book was written. Amazing. 600 years before it all happened. So it is Bible prophecy fulfilled that can help you have confidence in this book. 
Now, in case this is in the way a little bit, then God gave Daniel a dream. And his dream had a lion with wings and a bear with three ribs in its mouth and a leopard with four wings and an indescribable beast. He, he, uh, in the dream, Daniel couldn't think of an animal that looked like this, so we call it the nondescript beast. Um, it's the same history. It's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And you can read, just reading yourself, these things come out fairly clearly. Sometimes it's helpful to know the history, of course. But this creature, remember, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, it tells in there how this creature destroys everything in its path, just tramples and breaks, and uh, pretty, pretty good description of how the Roman Empire conquered these other nations until they were world rulers. And the, an interesting story is, if you read this, this creature has ten horns. And as Daniel is watching this play out, a littler horn, kind of a stout one it says in the Bible, comes growing up and uproots three of the ten. And so you can see the artist has pictured uh, some cracks in the ribs, and in, the, in the horns and so forth. And this little horn uh, has a mouth and speaks like a man. And it actually says in the reading of Daniel that the ten horns represent ten kingdoms. And so this little horn, which it's often called because that's what it's referred to in the Bible, is another kingdom which came along and ended up, you can't see this anymore, being a representation of that creature. And with that, we're done until tomorrow night. Please leave your cards with all these questions on the seat. Would you do that? I'd like to pray before you go. And uh, my appeal, folks, is please come back. Uh, I wish I was a more able presenter of these things, but uh, even if I'm a poor presenter, God will bless you. <laughs> and uh, bring someone with you. I think you can sense that what you learn here, folks, is a matter of life and death. Am I right? It is. You'd be surprised if you haven't thought. I, I mean, I don't think you'll be surprised uh, to, that I'm suggesting you have seen that. The Bible teaches folks that the truth will make us free. Sometimes people say to me, what does it matter if I believe this instead of that? Well, it's a fair question. But the end thereof, the Bible says, are the ways of death. We need to know what the Bible teaches. And so my, by God's grace, I want to be a source to help you dig into your Bible, perhaps like you never have before, and let me pray for that work. Father, we thank you that we could be together here this evening. Lord, I pray that you'd make this book thrilling in the hands of everyone that's been sitting here, and that we just can hardly wait to learn more from it, and that you would be our teacher, folks, not a person. Bless us all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.